I presume all of you know I'm going for a mission in a week's time. And one of the topics that I'm going to speak about during the Taiwan conference is on the topic on battling with the flesh. So I thought I'd give it a shot here first so that all of us could benefit. All right, we've just read just now from the scripture, 1 Peter 2, 11. And brethren, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage, wage war against your soul. And we also have Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, telling us not to gratify the desires of our flesh. And then he went on to talk about the many acts and the things of the flesh. Now, people, on, on the topic of flesh, now, it's a very common one in the Christian teaching. But it's also a topic that is widely misrepresented or misunderstood by believers at large. Now, often we heard people say, don't give in to the flesh. Don't give in. And in our mind, we only thought of flesh as something very outrightly undesirable, something that is commonly understood by the non-Christians also. Say, for instance, you know, don't be selfish, don't be jealous, don't be lazy, and stop smoking, stop getting drunk, stop your promiscuous life, now, so on and the like. Now, that's all about what many Christians understood about the flesh. Now, I'm not suggesting that what I mentioned just now are not acts and impulses of the flesh. But what I'm suggesting now is there could be more critical understanding about the flesh as it's revealed by the Word of God. Because whatever we have understood about flesh, as what we mentioned just now, it's nothing inspirational. Now, the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is the revelation of God. Now, the non-believer who doesn't know the Bible understood that same idea about flesh then something is critically missing. The unbeliever know it's not right to be jealous, to be selfish, hateful, and sexual immorality. They know. They know all these things. And we have non-Christian parents. They always tell us, don't give in to your flesh. Don't be lazy. Don't be selfish. Don't be distracted, and so on. So they see flesh as almost the same thing as what many non-believers see. Now, that's not right. So what is intrinsic about this flesh is what many of us fail to see. That's why some Bible translation translate the word flesh as sinful nature. You got it? It's a nature. It's a nature. And because of its nature, it's so powerful, it's so compulsive, so malevolent, irresistible, that anyone born in flesh, born to sin. You get what I mean? And the bad news is, we are all born in the flesh. We are all born with a nature to sin because of that sinful nature. We are all born with the tendency and disposition to sin. And just as God exists with a nature of good, he cannot but do good. So we are born in the sinful nature, so we cannot do anything but sin. You get what I'm trying to say? Now, you have to understand this part. Okay? We are all born with a nature to sin. We can do nothing but sin. So the flesh, being so intrinsically corrupted, that is, it's totally bad, totally corrupted, and so God, in all his goodness and love, he must come and redeem us supernaturally with his saving grace that all who repented of their sins, who turned to Jesus, will indefinitely experience a change of nature from a sinful nature to a spiritual nature. So you, who are born again in Christ, you are being transformed, regenerated, and from a sinful nature that you are born with, you are now 
given a spiritual nature. Now listen up, listen carefully, okay? But now it doesn't mean that you who have a spiritual nature, you will not sin anymore. Because while you are living in this earthly body, you must know that your sinful nature, and that is your flesh, hasn't died yet. Its sovereignty is merely replaced. It's being traded off. And so it no longer holds on to the sovereignty of your life. Now the Spirit of God, He is holding on to the sovereignty of your life, but that flesh is taking a back seat and He could be prompting you anytime. He will prompt you to live by it and succumb to it. And that brings us to the reality of the Christian struggle. If you are a true Christian, you will have the struggle of obeying the Holy Spirit or obeying that sinful nature, which is so familiar. So for that matter, you who is a true Christian, you will have battling in your conscience. You will have. And each time you, you succumb to your sinful nature, you will face the accusation of the satanic world, which your non-Christian friends doesn't have. And that accusation could leave you with guilt that cripple you, whether consciously or subconsciously. And there are Christians who live in those accusations day and night because they keep giving in to the flesh. And I've seen Christians who are tormented, who couldn't get to sleep because of those guilt coming from accusation. There are Christians with unfounded fears in their lives, always fearing that something bad will happen to them or their loved ones because of guilt unresolved in their life. And in my pastoral years, I've seen people's personality being molded and shaped because of the guilt in their lives. They left ministries, they left the church, and they become hateful people towards the church and the people at large. You see, the flesh and the satanic work of the accusation will bring about such a den in our Christian life. So I want you, my brethren, to be watchful, not to be given away to the schemes of the enemies. So today, we're going to really look through from the Bible how to bear the flesh. I'll give you a very <coughs> um, clear understanding from this message. Can we just quickly turn to Romans chapter 13? Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Now, It's a popular verse here in the church. And to do this understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The day of the Lord is coming soon, right? So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature, and that is your flesh. Now, these few verses have been very popular in the church arena, if some of you know the background of it. Now, many centuries ago, there was a God-fearing woman who had a son who is both very brilliant but also very wild. So the God-fearing mother has been praying for the son daily, so that the son could see the errors of his ways. And on one occasion, when this son, who was a young man, he went out all night merry-making and getting drunk, and now on his way home. Apparently, he was having a very bad hangover. 
and making his way home by the side of the garden. And what happened is, when he was walking by the side, coincidentally, there were some children in that garden playing with each other. And those children was calling out some, some child plays uh, phrases, you know. And literally, it says, pick up and read. Pick up and read, <laughs> you know. Literally, and the children was playing some children's game, you know. And what happened is just at that moment, this young man suddenly has this overwhelming sense of divine intervention into his life. And he stopped where he was. And there in the garden, he saw a copy of the New Testament. And with the children's, you know, phrase, pick up and read, still lingering on his mind. So he went and picked up that New Testament and let it fall. And then the pages opened randomly and he had his eyes on this verse. verse that verse I'm going to read to you again, verse 13. It says, Let us behave decently as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, as you read, each words of the text just pierced his soul. And he was so deeply provoked in his conscience and at that very moment, he was converted to Christianity. And some of you may know, that young man is none other than Aurelius Augustinus, commonly known as the father of theology, St. Augustine of Hippo, where virtually every historian will regard him as the most renowned theologian in the first 1,000 years of the church history. Now, coming back, Augustine was converted by this passage that brought such a great conflict in him between the flesh and the spirit. And then, let me tell you something that is noteworthy. Ten years after his conversion to Christianity, he wrote this very famous and renowned book called The Confession. Okay, this is his most famous book, The Confession. And that book talks about the sins that he committed as a youth and also his conversion. Now what happened is, that book, as famous as it could be, you know, almost every Christian in the Middle Ages have heard about and read that book. But later on, in the contemporary times, this book was deemed as an overrated English classic by some of the contemporary Western media critics. Now, why? Now, when the critic, now, the critic actually said, they don't think this book is anything spectacular. It doesn't seem to deserve the status and fame it has over the centuries. Because why? Because they think that St. Augustine was simply someone with a mind that is abnormally preoccupied with guilt. And those critics draw attention to a very famous passage in this book, Confession. And over here in this book of Confession, St. Augustine actually shared about with regards to one of the sins that he committed during his teenage years that make him most ashamed, his most shameful sin. What was that? No. What was that? So he recalled he was involved in a prank with some adolescent group of boys. They went over to a private garden and steal from a pear tree. <laughs> no? From a pear tree. They stripped the tree of all its pears, stole it, ate it, and left. And then now, St. Augustine, 40 years later, 
He is mourning over this childhood prank that he has committed. Now, what do you think? <laughs> now, what do you think? His most shameful sin. No. Now, I think most of us will think this is an overshot, you know. That's why the Western critics say, come on, Augustine, give me a break. <laughs> what is this, you know? There are people out there who committed murder, adultery, robbery, theft, much worse things that we could ima couldn't imagine. And this guy is all stricken with guilt by recalling that he stole some pears during his younger days. I mean, what is this? You don't understand, you know? Now, this is the thing where Augustine went on to explain what makes him so remorseful by the bare act of stealing that, that, those pears. Now, this is what he said. He said, no, it wasn't the bare act of stealing those fruits. He said, yeah, there were certain, thing, certain sins that I've committed. Though it is not excusable, but it's understandable. And for one, you know, Augustine has com confessed to the sins of sexual immorality, being sexually involved, and he has also fathered illegitimate children because of that, you know. And he has remorse for that. And he confessed about that, you know. But he said, though it is not excusable, but it's understandable. Because as a strong young man, you have that biological drive to be sexually involved. And many people, young men, at your weakest moment, you could possibly fall into it. Or there is a man who is starving. Because of his starving, he needs to eat, and that's why he stole. You get what I mean? Now, it's not excusable, but it's understandable. Or when someone who is so angry, he was provoked, and he killed someone in a fit of anger. Of course it is not excusable. But I could understand the force of the temptation to do so. But he said, but when I stole those pears, I actually didn't like pears. Which means to say, there is nothing that will stimulate my passion to steal those pears, except for one. That is the sure joy in doing something I knew was wrong. You saw that? Now, he was actually lamenting about the pure exercising of his flesh. That is the sure joy of doing something he knew was wrong. Now, do you, do you guys know that it has been said of all the crimes that has been committed, the most selfish crime is the crime of vandalism. Do you know that? Vandalism. No. It's, it doesn't sound like the most heinous crime. But it is the most selfish crime. Why? Because vandalism gives no motivation to the person who performs that deed other than the sheer pleasure of destroying someone else's property, and usually someone they don't even know. And in the States, I've heard young teenagers went into the neighborhood, break all the windscreen of the cars in the neighborhoods, you know, just for the fun of it. It's not as if they want to steal things, or it's not as if they, someone provoked them and they get back at them. No, just the sheer pleasure of it. It makes it exciting to do so because they know it's wrong. And that is the dark side of the human heart. Now, when I was like, preparing this message, you know, I, was, I, I remember during the times of Rome, you know, there, there was this round stadium called the Colosseum. Do you know Colosseum? If you have been to Europe, no, you will have to visit the Colosseum in Italy where the gladiators were seen like fighting with each other, you know, and sometimes prisoners sentenced to death were brought to the platform. And then lions and bears were released, and then you have a crowd of audience up there looking, witnessing at how these prisoners was helplessly and unfeelingly torn apart 
by those bees. And the unimaginable thing is everyone was jumping and laughing when these people are being torn to pieces by the bees. Now, this is different from killing someone because you are angry at him. Now, flesh at its core is that intrinsic love for evil. It is that love for everything that is godless. That is the true color of the flesh. It's not just watching some pornography to satisfy your sexual needs. It's not just getting you to commit a crime for money. It's godlessness in nature. And it misuses every freedom that is given. That is the flesh in every fallen human heart, if you know. Recently, my, my wife you know, was scrolling through her Facebook. She came across something that she had a shock of her life. Now, I don't know whether this is fake news. You know? Now, it was about, you know, in Taiwan, you know, there are some women, they actually offer free sex. And just to videotape the whole scene at different angle with interesting storyline, and post it on the internet to get viewership. I mean, what is that? It's not even for money. Do you know that? And you see people doing that, you don't know why. Where is the logic? It's not as if they like, they love it. It's just for the sheer fun. It's flesh in the true form. This dark side of the human heart. Every human heart has that flesh in them with that potential. Meaning every human being have that potential in them to reach that stage without God. Okay? So let's get to the meat of this message. Okay? I'm trying to make you understand what is flesh intrinsically. Okay? Now, before everything, now, to, to help you understand how to better the flesh, I have to bring you to understand the traits of the Christian enemy. The three-in-one enemy of Christians. And that is the world, the flesh, and Satan. Now, say with me. The world, the flesh, and Satan. Now, this is the traits of the Christian enemy. And I want you to know that so that you know when you are dealing with one, you are actually dealing with three together, okay? Now, listen how this goes. Number one, the world. Now, the world is that external environment that is in enmity with God and us. We know that. But simply put, the world is an external environment that will either persecute you with insults, threats, or death for your Christian faith, persecute. Or it will be used as a platform which Satan uses to tempt you. So it could be anything material, tangible or intangible. It can be money, it can be relationship, it can be career advancement, it can be an ideal marriage, it can even be freedom or any human ideologies in replace of God. That is the world. The world is always presenting this to you. Now, then what is the flesh, you ask? What is the flesh? Listen, when the world presents everything to you now, who loves it? The flesh loves it. You get what I mean? The world presents something, someone has to love it. And the flesh in us, this fallen, sinful nature, loves every bit of it. The world loves nothing, but the, the flesh loves nothing but the world. You get what I mean? The flesh loves nothing but the world. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we Christians cannot be successful. We, we cannot go for, you know, we cannot have money. We cannot... Marry, we cannot have sex, we cannot see our children grow up. No, I'm not saying that. Listen carefully. But God created all this for us to enjoy 
for his glory. But the flesh wants all this for its own. Without God in the picture, the flesh wants a freedom that is without God. It pursues the sure joy and pleasure of having its own sovereignty without any intervention, whether human intervention or divine intervention. Let me do what I want to do. Let me be what I want to be. Let me have the sure joy of doing so. Now, this is the flesh. That's why I mentioned to you St. Augustine. Now, when, you see, he found out when he wrote about confession, he's not overdoing it when he relates about his adolescent mischief. He was simply trying to, to tell us that a simple, pure mischief is actually not simple. It has its roots from the malevolent flesh that desires the sheer joy of doing evil. So he is totally led by that flesh, even as a teenager. You know, so someone who hasn't grown up yet, but somehow he realized, he discovered that thing in him. He doesn't like pests. He just wants to do it because he knows it's wrong. You get what I mean? That's the flesh. And then where is Satan in the picture? Now listen, where is Satan? Now we know him by his name, Satan, which means the accuser. And that is what he is all about. He is that fella, listen, if you read Job 1, 7 just now, he is that fella that goes to the righteous God day and night about the misdeeds of every human being. Now, that's why he said, when God asks, where do you come from? No, I come, I roam through the earth, back and forth. He leaves no one untouched. And what he saw and what he reported to God is every human being lives to gratify their flesh. You saw that, righteous God? You saw that? So everyone deserves hell. Everyone deserves punishment. And that's what Satan do. And he goes to God to accuse the Christian also. Now these are the people you have given them your redemption, your salvation. And look at how they are succumbing to their flesh. And that's why I say, we are all a guilt-ridden people. We are all crippled by our guilt. Sometimes our guilt is towards our parents, sometimes towards our loved ones, and sometimes towards God. And those guilts are intensified when the more truths we know. And you find that you are not able to live up to it. So Satan will always creep in with his accusation when you cannot overcome your sinful nature and give in to your temptation. That's why every time when we battle with the flesh, listen, we would also need to know how to overcome the accusations of the evil and live a clear conscience before God. Now, I will come to that later, all right? But coming back here now, Let's go back to the subject on flesh. Now, Paul over here spoke about a fallen state of humanity, flesh. Now, how do you understand flesh? Listen carefully, okay? When the Bible says flesh, it is not body, okay? It's not body. Flesh and body is different. The flesh is not your body. The struggle between the flesh and the spirit is not a struggle between the body and the soul or the body and the mind. You know, you always hear people say, hey, use your mind, don't give in to flesh. You know, use your mind. You know? Now, that's a wrong analogy, wrong reference to start with. Rather, when Paul was talking about this fierce battle between the flesh and the spirit, it is the power of sin in our natural fallen humanity against the influences of God in our lives. So the whole process of struggle and sanctification is what Peter calls a warfare. Now listen carefully. There is a war going on. As a Christian, there is a war between the flesh of man and the spirit of God. Because the flesh is in constant enmity towards God. So being a Christian, 
It's about getting into a war. Do you know that? Being a Christian is about getting into a war. That's why I get frustrated when people tell me that, yo, know, people or preacher who says, believe in Jesus and you have no more problem from now on. I mean, that's a lie. Do you know that? Life, our life, gets complicated after God came in. Do you realize that? It gets complicated. There are struggles, infightings in our conscience. You see, before I became a Christian, I have a relative degree of peace from not doing certain things that incur the wealth of my parents or not to disappoint my loved ones. You know. At least I have a certain degree of conscience. Now, I tell myself, before I was a Christian, now I can take advantage of people, but not too much. No, not too much. There's a standard I set for myself. But slowly, as I began to take advantage of people more and more, and that part of the conscience becomes smeared. And then I no longer felt too bothered about it. That's why you see people in this world, they can readily accept any doctrine, any schools of thoughts, any practice, which initially they feel it doesn't look right, but later on, when it becomes culturally accepting, whether it's LGBT, whether it's abortion, whether whatever, they will just accept it readily because the conscience becomes smear. They are their own standard. There is no truth, no Holy Spirit in their lives. That's why I call it a, only a certain relative degree of peace from your fallen conscience. You can never have absolute peace. But after I became a Christian, I get a new conscience. And things started to be a, a lot more complicated now, especially after the truths that I know. And my conscience tells me that doing something or saying something with some self-centered intention, now I know it very well in me, that conscience is no longer yielding to any form of my own standard, but to God's standard, to the Spirit of God. So you see, this is, this is where life becomes a bit more, or I could say a lot more complicated. And my brethren, that does not mean to say after you have given your life to the Lord Jesus, now, that will be the end of better, or, or things will get. Let me just say that. After you've given your life to Jesus, the flesh is not totally annihilated. It's not fully destroyed. As I've said, it takes a backseat. And it's always waiting to sprung up in activity. It's waiting. And the war goes on like that. So now I'm going to go to the, the main thing about the message that is battling the flesh. I'm going to offer you four things, four ways that you should know from the Bible on how to battle your flesh. Galatians chapter 5. Can you go with me to Galatians chapter 5? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Now there you read. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. You saw that? It's an enmity to the influences of God. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're always fighting. There is a war going on. They are in conflict with each other. And so that you do not do what you want. Now, that's the infightings in your conscience. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now, the mention of law here. Now, I'll explain that later. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, you know. I mean, some of it are acts that you can see, you know, outright acts. You know, you can see it. Someone commit adultery, or someone, you know, idolatry, witchcraft, you can see those things. But there are some things that you cannot be seen. Hatred, discord, jealousy, it's very much in a person. Fits of rage, 
selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. So if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. If you are living by the fruit of the Spirit, bearing it, feeding on the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. You are not constrained by law. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Can we read the last verse together? Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, battling the flesh. Now, before I talk about getting into the act of battling with the flesh, let me ask, who started this battle? Who started this war? Now, the simple answer is, God started it. God started the war. Now, in our relative peace and enjoyment, living by our flesh, on our way to hell, so to speak, it is the Holy Spirit who came in with the regeneration and started this whole war. You get what I mean? And it, this is called the process of sanctification. And by this whole process of struggle and sanctification, we know we are bound for heaven. Amen to that? Okay? I said again, by this whole process of struggle and sanctification, we know we are going to heaven. You are assured about that. So, let me say it again. This war is started by God. So, if a war is started by the Almighty God, that war is a sure win. God never loses a war, right? God never loses a war. The war on sanctification will go on and on. So if you are born again in your teens, you will get your sanctification right when you are born again in your teens, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, until you see the Lord. And the Lord himself will keep winning the better after better in your lives. Okay? Maybe not. It doesn't seem so today, but tomorrow. Next month, next year, through some incident, God will keep winning that war on sanctification. But listen, listen carefully now. But the winning of that war again and again is brought through a sanctifying and struggling process in your life. And what is that struggle all about? And that is the struggle to live by the Spirit of God. Listen carefully. That is the struggle to live by the Spirit of God. And that's why Galatians say, if you live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Now, for some people, it's a very painful process because they, are, they have strongholds in their lives. They have strongholds. And those strongholds in their life sometimes cause them to grieve the Holy Spirit again and again by giving in to a lifestyle that is unpleasing to God. You saw that in Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 5, falsehood. Some people live with falsehood. Some people are stealing, always getting angry, engaging in profanity, unwholesome talk, being given to anger, jealousy, and bitterness, so on and so forth. And because of that, the Holy Spirit is relentless, incentivizing you. The Holy Spirit has to work on you more compellingly out of his love. He has to rebuke you. He has to wake you up to your senses. And that's why sometimes things go wrong in lives. You don't know why, you know. But God has every good intention to win this preacher better for you. Now, but coming back, let me say, whoever it is, if you are a true Christian, the better of sanctification is never a seamless process. Every true believer will experience some sort of refining in their lives. And through that refining, you have to die to yourself. 
Now, it doesn't ha it got, that has nothing to do with whether you have good personality or not, or whether your, your results are good or not, or whether you're nice to people or not. It doesn't have to do that. It doesn't have to do with that. The process of sanctifying is not seamless. For every true Christian, there will be tears, there will be frustration in that battle. There will be, okay? How many of you, you never struggle, you have no tears before as a Christian? Now, you look at the preacher, our preacher, preacher Hui Jin. She's by far one of the women with the best personality I've ever known. She's prim and proper. You ask her whether there are tears in her Christian life. Now you ask her. <laughs> no. Now then you ask pastor, pastor, do you have tears in your Christian life? I mean, that's a stupid question. Of course there is. You get what I mean? Of course there is. But let me say, all these emotional upheavals in the process of sanctification is to bring you to a state of spirituality where you will be careful to live by the Spirit. Now, I'm coming back to this. Live by the Spirit. God takes no pleasure in giving you emotional upheavals. You know, your heart go up and down like a roller coaster ride. You know, what is God doing in all this? What do you want, God? Now, you ask. The simple intention is to bring you to live by the Spirit. Listen carefully. When you want to battle with your flesh, it's not about using your will. No, Pastor, I'm going to use my will to stop my flesh from controlling me, you know, from influencing me. No. You are born in that flesh. That flesh is so powerful. It's a second nature to you. No one of you can use your will to fight this flesh. But God said, your will is meant for the purpose of living by the Spirit. And when you live by the Spirit, the strength of that Spirit will overcome the flesh. You get what I'm trying to say? You get what I'm trying to say now? Live by the Spirit, and then you will not gratify. Right? The strength of the flesh will not be so overwhelming. But you exercise your will against it, you will lose. You know what I mean? And then you ask, Pastor, what is it but live by the Spirit? <laughs> now, now, live by the Spirit is not going out there, speaking in some tongues, and then feel that you're all fired up and exercised up to fight a battle. No. Living by the Spirit is as simple as knowing what the Lord's will is. Knowing what is pleasing to God. Test what the will of God is. Right? Test what the will of God, having the mind and the heart to live by the will of God. God, tell me what is pleasing to you. I acknowledge you and set yourself before me and you live by it. That is living by the Spirit. And even when you fall, you are caught in a sin and you who live by a Spirit will struggle with God will struck God, I know you're rebuking my conscience now. Now, I know you're right there working on my conscience now. Live by the Spirit. Struggle through it. And then, the strength of your flesh will be weakened. You know what I mean? Now, that's the way. Now, it's such a peculiar thing, you know. It's not easy. Now, so many people thought, what is flesh? Is it just trying not to be lazy? Is it just trying not to be selfish? It's living by the Spirit, okay? And one day I'll just talk more about what is living by the Spirit, but you just take it as it is living by the will of God, okay? And then when you live by the Spirit, live by the will of God, live in submission to God, what happened is Galatians says, there the fruits of the Spirit will be produced. Now, just now I just said, live by the Spirit, right? And you live by the Spirit, walk with God, the fruits will be produced. The fruits. Now, what is the fruits here? Now, love, joy, peace,
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And the Bible says, against such things, there is no law. And verse 18 says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now, why, why the mention of the law here? Why the mention of the law here? Simply because the law can never overcome the flesh. How can the law clamp down on the flesh? The law can only clamp down on the acts and the manifestation of the flesh. Say, if you commit adultery, if you murder someone, you malign someone, no, I can clamp you down the law. But the flesh is something unseen. For instance, before you commit adultery, there is lust. There is jealousy. There is selfish ambition, right? When, before you kill someone, there's jealousy, there's envy. And the love of such things, you know. The people who are, you know, there are people who are really wicked in this world. The, the law cannot clamp down on them. Do you know that? Now, I remember when I was in, in secondary school, I have some classmates, they are very ill-mannered, very foul-mouthed, you know very bad tempered, they get into fights easily and they got punished. And every time when people are like quarreling, you know, getting into fights in the class, and they're on the corner of my class, there are two girls, two girls. They never get into any fights, any quarrels, but I know they are always happy seeing people in conflicts. They like to see the world burn. They like to see things get out of hand. They like to see people hate each other, you know. And two of them are always laughing with each other as if they are enjoying the show, you know. When some cranky fellas in the class, you know, fight, you know. Now, the law of the school cannot clamp them down, right? The law of the school can do nothing about... The law of the school can only clamp those who are fighting, those who smoke, those who play truancy. But you see, the law cannot deal with jealousy, envy, hatred <laughs> at the core. It cannot deal with those things. It can only deal with the outward manifestation. But mind you people, God knows the heart of man. And the heart of man needs to feed on something, right? You need to feed on something. It's either you feed on hatred, jealousy, envy, selfish ambition, and then uh, because I'm, I'm jealous, I have this selfish ambition, I want to make my way up, you know, I don't care, I step on people, you know, I just go. Now, you have to feed on something. Now, the heart, the heart, to go, knows that for, for us to go far, we have to feed on something. And people who feed on the flesh, now you see, they cannot control themselves. Right? But when your heart feed on the fruits of the Spirit, when you're doing good to people, when you love your spouse in kindness, now pornography cannot come near you. Hatred and discord cannot come near you. You get what I mean? That's why the Bible calls it the fruits of the Spirit. As you walk with the Spirit, you bear those fruits and you feed on those fruits. And then you will start to recognize there's nothing good, nothing pleasant about the flesh. You get what I mean? No, it's something very spiritual. <laughs> But you have to understand what I'm driving at, okay? Why, why do I have to say that? Just now, what did I say? What is the traits of the Christian enemy? The world, right? The flesh, and Satan. Now, what is the world? The world will always present you with anything material. Success, fame, position, right? so that you will be tempted, so that your flesh will love it and bring you along with it to love it, to feed on it, right? But now, when you feed on the Spirit of God, or feed on the fruits of the Spirit, right? The fruits of the Spirit, the love, goodness, kindness, self-control, you know? When you feed on it, the world loses its power against you. You get what I'm trying to say? Okay, that's, that's something for you to think through, okay? 
So when I say you deal with one, you have to deal with all. You cannot just deal with the flesh per se. There is also the world, the external environment you are living in. You get it? Okay. And now, the last one. Satan. Okay, now Satan. What did I say just now? He is that fellow who goes to God and accuses everyone day and night. Because the whole world lives for the flesh, right? And even the Christians succumb to the flesh. Now listen carefully. This is, could be the most important part in this message, okay? Because if you don't know how to overcome the accusation of Satan, let me just tell you, the power of flesh, it's invincible, okay? Now, listen carefully. Just now I've said, right? The flesh is so powerful that without the help of the spirit, there is simply no way to overcome it. Our positive thinking, our will is helpless against it. Nothing in our human capacity can go against it. And you saw that in Peter, right? Peter. And Peter, when, when he gave in to the flesh, when the Roman soldiers and the chief priests is coming for, for Jesus, Peter in his flesh, right? Before that, in his flesh, he claimed he would die for Jesus. And then after when the armies or the soldiers came, in his flesh, he draw the sword. And after Jesus was taken away, and he was given over to flesh, his fear, and he denied the Lord three times. Now, anger, impulsiveness, fear. Now, it sounds so familiar, right? And with each giving in to the flesh, Satan accused him again and again, drawing away his reliance upon God again and again, and finally reducing him to a helpless, guilt-stricken disciple who went away to fish even after Jesus has resurrected, right? And this is the same thing Satan is doing to us in our weakness. So, you can be hearing message like this, spiritual message like this, again and again, but it's inevitable you will fall again. So in fact, we don't go through a day without giving in to our flesh. Do you notice that? So our adversary, Satan, will always take that opportunity to accuse us. He hit us at our soft spot. He accused us in areas we are weak at. So the common voice you hear in your spirit is, such a Christian you are. Such a father or a mother you are, you know. Such a typical person you are. The non-believer are better than you. Or such a Christian you are. Such a pastor you are. <laughs> you know, such a pastor. You know. No, look at what every pastor is doing. You know. No, pastor like us, we hear this kind of voice in our heart. And, and let me tell you, what is, what, what, what is so helpless for us is because those accusations sound real. Sounds real. Okay? A lot of times, we indeed fall short. The motives of our hearts are not pure. Sometimes, we really don't lift up to certain standards but what the Bible says or what our loved ones demand of us. So the way to overcome the accusation of this enemy is never to prove that you are good. It's never even to prove that you are good in the eyes of men or anyone, but to humbly claim the blood of Christ and what that blood has done for you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, they overcame him that is the accuser, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That is the word of God. And Romans chapter 10, verse 7, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You saw that? 
So to overcome the accuser, what the word says is that matter. It's not what you feel that matter. You can feel regretful, you can feel guilt-stricken about the things you have said or done, but have faith in what the word says and in his salvational works, not your goodness. You see, but I understand as young people, now I was young before, and I mean, I'm still fighting a spiritual battle now. I know some of you may be guilt-stricken because of repeated sins that you've committed. Oh, I've done it again. Even after I confess my sins to God, I succumb to it again, you know. Now, let me say, all of us here, we are guilty of committing sin more than once. The same sin more than once, right? Anyone here not guilty about it? Any one of you just commit the sin once and you confess and you never do it again? Anyone? No, right? I mean, a true Christian life will have the experience of repetitive sins. Now, to deal with repetitive sins, I've actually chosen a verse just now that we've read. It is that verse when Peter asked Jesus, you know, how many times should we forgive our brother if they sin against us? And what happened is Jesus said, now Peter said, is it seven times? Jesus said, no. It's 77 times. Now, we know seven is a complete number. Now, Jesus was not talking about maths now. Okay? It's not 77. It's not 490 times. When he says 77 times, it simply means complete forgiveness. It's as if the forgiveness that God has given us. He has forgiven us completely in Christ. Okay? Because God knows the helpless state you are in now. So, God gives you complete forgiveness. So, to deal with repeated sins, listen carefully, is really a, knowing the truth about complete forgiveness. Every time we talk about complete forgiveness, we use this phrase. We say, God forgave and forget. Right? We always say, forgive and forget. Now, it's a good phrase to use. But I, when I was young, I always have, I'm always puzzled. What do you mean by God forgive and forget? You mean God have this memory lapse and then suddenly after I've confessed my sins that he, he forgotten what I've just said or what I, the sins that I committed yesterday? That cannot be, right? How can God have a memory lapse that way? You see, the thing is we are human. When we being human, when, when we talk about forgiving, it's hard because when someone wrong us and he says sorry to me, and then he come again and wrong me again and say sorry, I will remember he just said sorry. So how can you do it again? You see? So we have the problem of remembering the wrong of people. So we, we tend to wonder whether God, you said you forgive me, but do you remember that I just did it a few days ago? I just did it just now again and all. So listen, when God says, I forgive you completely. He means that the way he deals with us is that he does not count our earlier sins against us after we confess those sins. Say for instance, you sin against God, guilt stricken about it, so you confess. Walk away, helplessly sin again, and then you confess again. Walk away, helplessly sin again. How many times? That's sin number three. Right? That's sin number three. If you sin against me this way, I'll look at you. I say, brother, I forgive you two times already, all right? Okay? But this is the third time you are doing it to me, okay? But to God, when he say, I forgive and forget, I forgive you completely, meaning that although you are doing the same thing for the third time, he will look at it as it's a fresh sin. You get what I mean? He will look at it as it's the first time. He could empathize with you when you fall into it again because maybe the first time you fall into it is because of your circumstances. The second time you fall into it is because of some accusation or your spouse don't understand you, you are emo about it, you know, and you fall again, you know. And then come the third time, so every time God deals with you, God knows it's a fresh circumstances. God knows it's a fresh struggle that you have. 
So he goes through. By dealing with you the first time, finish it, you confess. Second time, finish, confess, finish it. And the third time, he's dealing with you again. I'm not saying God will not discipline you. But God will discipline you. And God reduces you to brokenness. And you confess your sin and say, God, you said, if we confess our sins, you are just and faithful. You will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, I know I fall again, but you look at this sin as a fresh one and you are dealing with it again. So let me say, let me say, when we are dealing with repeated sins, always go to God sincerely and turn to God, turn away from your sins and turn to what God say. Sincerely and genuinely confess your sins. And let him speak to you, correct you, rebuild you, and renew you. Add that very particular sin. Okay? Let me say that. Deal with it. Finish it off. And then the next time you fall again, go to him again. Pray through. Struggle through. And let God know that you are broken and how you are struggling, but you still fail. Right? Now, true confession, again and again, will strengthen your conscience. It will strengthen your heart against the power of the flesh. You get what I'm trying to say? Okay? Don't be given over to accusation and then start thinking that, oh, this is the fifth or, or the tenth time I'm doing it. You know, it's useless. You know, nothing's going to help. And... God is going to feel that I've taken him for granted. No, that's not the way God looks at us. He forgives and forgets. Which means to say, he always deals with our sin as the very first time. So I pray for you, okay? So when you want to fight Satan, number one, you know God has already won the battle. He's fighting for you. Number two, you know you are weak against your flesh. What did I say? So the way to fight it is not by your will, but it's to live by the Spirit. Walk with God. Okay? Test His will. Live pleasing lives. And then third, enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. Feed on it. Okay? And even despite that, you will still fall. Overcome the accusation of Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the promise of complete forgiveness as given by God. All right? So don't let your sins accumulate. You get what I mean by accumulated sins? Accumulated sins meaning you don't confess your sins. You know, you moan and groan, oh, I've sinned again, I've sinned again, I can't pray, you know, I don't feel like listening to the word, I can't. And then Satan will come down harder and harder on you with his accusation. And then you will draw further and further away from God, you know. And that's how you become more and more helpless against your flesh. You get what I mean? Now, that's not the way to fight this spiritual battle against the flesh. So, uh, I hope I've given you enough on this message. It's a very intense one, okay? <laughs> very intense one. But if you are struggling with your flesh, I believe every one of you is, okay? It's just that whether you are conscious about it or not, okay? But let it be clear that it's a good thing to struggle, okay? It shows that you are living a true Christian life and you are fighting a good war and God is fighting it for you and you will win. Come, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the word that you've given us. And I pray that our brethren here who receive your word will really understand the spirituality of it, especially an unseen enemy in our nature that is constantly working and in activity. We need your help. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to be, rem to be reminded by the truth again and again. So God, I pray that you help these people, young and old, you know, 
We succumb to flesh in one way or another. But I pray, Lord, and uh, with this message, you will clear our doubts. Let us know your truth and promises so that we will fight meaningful battle. And we know that you have given us the promise of victory. So we claim your promise and keep, you know, waging war against the flesh. And that is consuming us day and night. So Lord, thank you so much. And uh, give you all the praises. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.